Hello everyone and welcome to part two of the stability lecture. Before I go on, there was a slight mistake that I made in the previous lecture. So you can just recall if you go back to slide 13 on it when we were completing the table. Um, because of how small this thing is and of course because I don't have a class in front of me to prompt me, there was a little error when I was tabulating this table for you. Right? When we were tabulating S1, Okay, so the first, this number here is going to be 1 by 4 minus 2 by 5. So 1 by 4 minus 2 by 5 divided by 1, which will give me minus 6. All right, so minus 6 goes here. Here, when I was tabulating it, uh, because of how small it was, I, I put the wrong thing on the screen here. What is what is in the slide is correct, but what I wrote on the on the screen for you was not. And the, the correction very quickly is so we have minus six here. Here is the row above that we're looking at this and this. So one by zero is zero. Two by nothing. Once it's blank, it's a, you can assume it's a zero. So one by zero is nothing, two by zero is nothing. So therefore this cell here is going to be empty or you can put zero, but it doesn't matter, you can leave it blank. Okay, and then the last rule for S zero would be, so I have minus six here. And of course, if I'm getting this rule here, I'm looking at the two rows above. So it's going to be, going to be minus six by five right minus six by five right minus one by zero but this is it, nothing over minus six right so you're going to get five here right which is where the the um the table was so so if you complete it you would get what i have here so this is correct Right, but my tallying of it, I think what I did, I actually calculated a value for here because I, um, because of how small it was, I, I um, confused my own self with the with the, um, the the writing on the screen. All right, which is a point just to make as well too. When you're doing this thing, um, give yourself a lot of room. Right, draw over the table every time you calculate a new value so that you 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 um, avoid making unnecessary mistakes. Okay. So let me stop that and we will get to the second part of our discussion on stability. So as we said, the, the, the Routh Hurwitz criterion looks at two things. First off, after you tabulate the table, once you get the table in some form, so the first column is going to be a column of S's, the various um, indices is going to start at the highest index and work their way down to s to the power zero. Next to it, that column here, which is the first column of numbers, the criterion says two things. First, everybody in here must be positive in that column. And secondly, if it isn't positive, if there's somebody who is not positive inside of there, then if you count the number of sign changes in that column as you go down, that is going to tell you how many of the roots of that system have real parts are positive. In other words, it's going to, if you were to ever solve it and take the inverse transform of it, you will get an e to the plus something t, which is an increasing exponent. So that's, for, for most simple systems, um, the filling out the, the, the outhose table is fairly straightforward. Once you don't make mistakes, like I just did, um, you should have a good answer in front of you. There are a couple of exceptions, however, and this is where they, they because systems are, um, you get all sorts of systems and depending on how you design it and what sort of assumptions you make, you may end up being in a situation where the, the answer is not straightforward. So now here are a couple of things that we will lead to. If you have a characteristic equation looking like this, you know, the characteristic equation is the denominator of the transfer function, and you set that equal to zero. So if I follow the, the, the outer risk criteria here and tabulate, 
This is a third order system. So the first row is going to have S3 and S, and the second row is going to have S squared and the constant, right? Remember, this is really 2S to the power zero, if you want to look at it that way, right? So the next column, the next cell below, this one, S1 here, you look at the two rows immediately above. So this is going to be two by one, which is two minus one by two, which is two, all over the first answer, two. So I'm going to get one, is it? Two, sorry, zero. 2 minus 2 is 0, not 1. 2 minus 2 is 0 over 2. So I'm going to get a 0 inside of here. Let me just put that in. So if I just work this out, 2 minus 2 is 0 over 2. Well, of course, it's 0. So I have 0 inside of here. And if I have 0 inside of here, how do I um, calculate the rest of the table? At that point in time, if I have zero inside of here, I can't determine the next row because whatever it is, zero by zero, but then I'm going to have a zero over zero. So this now goes, brings us to two special cases um, that we're going to deal with. So in all, the Rothschild's criteria handles three cases. The first is when no element in that column the first column I'm calling the, the column of the constants, not the column with the S's. The column with the constants, no element in that column is zero. And that was what we did in the, the first part of the lecture. The second one is if the first element of some row is zero, but the remaining elements of that row either do not exist or are not zero. So in other words, if I have, for instance, um, this row here, if I have this value is zero, but the rest of the elements in that row are either empty or not zero. So for instance, here could be five and here could be blank, right? That's the first thing, but you have, in other words, you have a zero here, but you have some other values inside of here. It might be another zero and some other numbers, but you have some numbers inside of here. And then the third one is where the first element is zero and everybody else in that row is also zero. So in other words, this whole row is zero. Okay? Are we going to see how to handle those special situations? This was in the part one of the lecture. That's a straight one with the tabulation. Now we go to the other two cases, case two and three. So in case two, which is like um, the example that we're doing right now. So we have a zero here. Well, how do we finish it off? Well, what we do is that we make a small assumption and we let, we replace the zero element by a very small positive number. We call the number epsilon. So epsilon is a positive number. Remember that we're saying that the Ruth Hurwitz or Ruth Hurwitz criteria and wants everybody in this column to be positive, strictly positive, which means they must be greater than zero, right? So let's assume for the time being, we want to see, we, we just calculated that this was zero, but we don't know what's happening elsewhere. So what we're going to do is to assume that this instead of zero is something a little bit bigger than zero. We call it a, sm uh, a small number. We're using the, term, we, we use the, the Greek letter epsilon and we see if we can complete the rest of the table. If we complete the rest of the table, if that is epsilon here, then this value here would be two epsilon minus zero over epsilon, which is two, right? Fair enough? So if we complete that now, and then we look at the sign changes, how many sign changes are present? There are no sign changes, and we assume that everybody is, is, is positive because of that um, um, little that, that epsilon that we put in, right? If there are no sign changes elsewhere, then the system appears to be stable. That zero 
is all of the elements, well, because one is zero, all of the elements are not strictly positive. What the zero is in indicating is that we have a pair of purely imaginary roots. In other words, the roots are on the geomega axis, the imaginary axis of the S-plane, right? So if that is the case, this system is what we call marginally stable. In other words, this system will oscillate, but the oscillations will not um, die down or they will not increase to an unbounded level. And in fact, this type of system is what we use when we create oscillators. A T O R S oscillators. Yeah, right? Like the Weinberg oscillator and the kind. If you were to, to, to um, go back to the, um, the transfer function for those when you, when you simplify it, if you were to do the Routh Hurwitz or solve for the poles of that transfer function, you're going to get that the system has a pair of a positive, um, sorry, a pair of purely imaginary roots. There are no real parts there. They're right on the J omega axis. And of course, remember something as well. Once systems have complex roots, the, the roots must uh, um, exist as complex conjugates. Okay, that is a, 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 a sort of law of complex numbers. If you have a solution, um, you must have a, a com and the solution is complex, there must be a conjugate existing somewhere on the place. Right, so that's case one. Let's look at this one now. So this now is a fifth order transfer function and we want to determine if there are any poles in the right hand plane. In other words, is the system unstable? And we will know that if we see when we complete the table, if anybody in this column, if there are any negative signs appearing in that column, we know that the system is unstable. All right, so we sit down, table, draw the table, and you start working it out. So this value here, right, the value for S cubed, so again, you enter it. So the first row is the S fifth row, so I will enter the coefficient of S5, which is 1, the coefficient of S cubed, which is 24, the coefficient of S, which is minus 25. And then the next row, which is the S4 row, I will enter the coefficient of S, S to the power of 4, which is 2, the coefficient of S squared, which is 48, and the coefficient of S to the power of 0, which is minus 50. So we have that, and we go cell by cell again, and complete it so that the next row down, the S cubed row here, this value, we're looking at the two, the two rows above. Um, so we're looking at these values here. So that value is going to be two by 24 minus one by 48 all over two, right? 2 by 24 is 48. 48 minus 48 is 0. So this value here is going to be 0. Yeah. And then the next value here, right, is going to be, you're taking this and this now. So it's going to be 1 by minus 50. Let me write it here. 1 by minus 50 minus um, 25, my, my minus 2 by minus 25, all over 2. So this is minus 50 plus 50, so you're going to get another 0 here. Right. So this is bringing us to the third case that we want to deal with, where everybody in a particular row is now zero. How do we handle that? Well, this is the most complicated of the lot. So once you have two zeros here, then I can't go any further. I can't calculate the S squared and therefore the S1 and therefore the S to the power zero. So how do we handle that? Again, this is all part of the polynomial theory. What you do now is that you look at the row that is zero and then we look at the row immediately above that. So we are going to look at, this is the row that is zero. We take a look at the row immediately above that. So wherever that zero, 
row occurred, you take the you you now examine the row above it. So you look at the row above it. The row above it has coefficients 2, 48, and, and 50. So we write out a polynomial for that row. So it's 2s4. Remember how we derived it in the first place? So this is 2s to the power 4 plus 48s squared minus 50. Right? We call that the auxiliary polynomial. And remember, this is part of the big one. Eh? 2s4 minus 48s to the power 4 uh, minus 50. Look at here, right? 2s to the power 4 plus 48s squared minus 50. So we're just extracting this from the, the main polynomial. We extract that, but we do it by looking at the table itself. It's easier to do there. So you extract that, and we call this the auxiliary polynomial now. And what we're going to do, again, this is all part of the polynomial theory, is we don't need to know how it works. This is a straight applying the theory. You'll meet some of this and, and why it works in advanced controls, but not here and not your second year controls. So after you have the auxiliary polynomial, you take a derivative of the auxiliary polynomial. Now you see what's going to happen. If I take a derivative of this, I'm going to get something, a polynomial with the order S cubed in it, which is the rule that is giving me the trouble. Remember, if I go back here, the S cubed rule, I can't fill out the S cubed rule because straight off the, the s cubed row is giving me some issues. I have zeros. So I'm going to get a replacement s cubed row by taking the auxiliary polynomial, finding the derivative, and entering those two coefficients into it now, which will be 8 and 96. Right? So 8 and 96. The derivative of that is 4 to 8 s cubed plus 98 s. Right? So once you do that, and then now you um, continue to, to, to um, fill out the rest of the table. So the S squared value now, right, which is the next one to do, right? So you have this, so S squared is going to be 8 by 48 minus 2 by 96 divided by 8. And then here will be 8 by minus 50 minus 2 by nothing divided by 8. So you can keep going like that. And if you fill it out, you're going to get these numbers coming at you. Right? And again, this point. If you're filling it out, so we have to make a decision here because this rule was already zero. So we made a decision by using the rule above to give us some coefficients here to allow us to go down and complete the table. So you perform the same steps again. And then once you complete the table now, and notice this, if you if you land up with another zero row, so let's say we were, we were going merrily along the place, and somehow this row turned out to be zero, zero, then what we would do is to take the row above, which is 24s squared minus 50, right? And take the derivative of that, which would have been 48s and put a 48 in here and go on the way, yeah? It didn't turn out that way. And most times you, you wouldn't have that. So you keep going and you fill out the table. Remember, this is really 0 and 0, yeah? All right? But we made an assumption because it was 0 and 0, we did a manipulation to allow us to fill in the rest of the table. So how many sign changes are present in this case? You have, you count the changes as you go from cell to cell. No sign change, no sign change, no sign change, no sign change, one sign change. So this has one sign change, which means that there is one pole with a positive real part. In other words, one pole whose, whose real part is out on the right-hand side of the S-plane. Right, And in fact, there's one sign change, of course, well, once you have a negative value inside of the, in, in the column, the system is unstable. So we got a negative number here, so that system is unstable. And the zeros in the table, in that row, 
indicate that they are pair of real roots but opposite in sign. Right? Remember, we said that the sign change first of showing us that we have one root that occurs on the right hand side. That's him here. But this exists is part of a, of a pair. So there's a plus or minus one, a pair of opposite real roots, right? And then there are two complex conjugate imaginary roots. We have these two here. Those two give us, let me go back to this slide. Those two gave us these values here, right? So the complex conjugate gave us the first zero, and the, the other one gave us the, 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 the root that has the one part that is over on the right hand plane, gave us the other one. So you have a system here that is unstable and that you have by counting the sign changes and so on, you are, you know that the system now has at least a pair of uppers, a, a, um, a pair of roots, but one of them is of course on the right hand plane. So without going to here, you don't have to go to here. Remember the whole idea is to avoid this, right? Looking at the behavior of, of the system just as it is, the number of sign change, one sign change, one, the system is unstable, the one sign change told us that there's a pole on the right hand plane. And the first zero, which was like what we had done before, tells us we have a pair of complex conjugate poles right on the imaginary axis. So you can get all of that information without ever actually having to solve for S. Yeah? And that's the beauty of it. So now we come down now to the kind of problem like, like, like the past people. Right, which is where you use the technique now. And this is the interesting part. The tabulation part is straightforward, but the, the application is for something like this. So here's a system, and they want you to determine the value of k for which the system is stable. So you have to fill in the route to this thing. Remember what we could have done is to solve this if we could. You could put this somehow and you get s in terms of k. And then you manipulate k to c when S will have a, a, a real part that goes into the, 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 um, the right hand side of the S plane. This technique now is going to allow us to do it without getting to that stage. So step one, we complete the, 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 the table as we know before. So the highest order, so the first row is going to be S cubed and S to the power one. So that's coefficient here is one and four. And the next row S squared, the coefficient is two and K. So if you complete the table, right, here is going to be two by four, which is eight minus K over two, which is two. So eight minus K over two. And then the bottom rule here is going to be eight minus K over two which is this cell here. Let me just clear it up and let's do that. So I don't take, right? So this row here, this cell here, sorry, is going to be, we look at the block above. So eight minus K over two, multiply by K minus two by nothing, which is nothing over 8 minus k over 2 that is equal to k right so you fill it in right you fill it in let me just clear that so we now have the table looking like that now we know that the criterion says that everybody inside of here must be strictly positive in other words greater than zero so we look at each of the rules. Well, this is greater than zero, that is greater than zero. For this one to be greater than zero, we have to see what value of k will do that. And for this one to be greater than zero, well, straight off, we could say that k has to be greater than zero in this rule. But there's another one that will, another value for k that may come up in that, in the, in the S1 rule. So we look at that. According to that rule, rule three, if, 
this row, this number inside of it has to be greater than zero. It means that eight minus k over two has to be greater than zero. In other words, k has to be less than eight. And we just saw that in this case, k has to be greater than zero. So in other words, k has to be greater than zero or less than eight in order that everybody in this column is positive. So the range of values for k to be stable means that k has to have some values between 0 and 8. If k is equal to 0, if k is equal to 0, then this cell here will be 8 minus 0 over 2. So here would be 4, and here would be 0. That would be one of those cases with marginal stability. That's case two that we discussed a little while ago. And if k is equal to eight, then this one here is going to be zero. So either k being equal to zero or eight will result in marginal stability. And the marginal stability is where you're going to have a pole that is right on the j omega axis here. But if you want absolute stability, k has to be less than 8. So it could be 7.99999, or it could be 0 0.0000001. Right? Once it's bigger than 0 or less than 8, then this system will be stable. Right? And then you come back now. So we're now in a position to solve this. So the, the, the solution, of course, now. Notice, read the question carefully. Find a closed loop transfer function. Well, that is easy. We saw that. It's G and H. You could figure out that. Find the range of K which will drive the system unstable. So if you go back to what we just did, K is stable in this particular example here. K is stable for this range of values. So for this system to be unstable, all right, if k is outside of this range, so for instance, if k is greater than or equal to 8, this system will be unstable. So you look at the wording of the question, right? If it asks the system to be stable, that is one thing, or if it asks us to be unstable. So what you would do, the Rothschild's criteria will tell you what would make the system stable. So everything else will make it unstable, yeah? It's just an uh, inversion of it and just a different way of asking the question. Sometimes they, they, well, well, what you need to know is what will make this thing, K is a gain factor, for instance. So what will make this thing go unstable for me, right? Um, and that is the, the, the thing that a controls person or a designer, or if this is the, 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 the transfer function for an oscillator, for instance, um, the unstable part, is a part that we might want because that is what will make the thing oscillate in the first place, right? Stability will make the oscillations die down. So it depends on the, the context of the question that you're dealing with or the situation, yeah? So um, these two lectures, as you saw, is, is, the, the material is, is straightforward. It's a straightforward manipulation. So if you go through the lecture, listen to the lecture, um, forgive my um, little errors, because I try to correct them as I come around. And as I said, it's if, if I don't have anybody in class asking me questions, sometimes it's only when I when my own brain tells me, wait a minute, you said something that didn't make sense. Right? Then I'll have to try to correct it. But I can't stop the recording to start it back. So um, if you see anything that doesn't make sense, of course, we will discuss it in class. OK? So your job is to listen to, to, to these, um, these two. And well, we'll go through some problem set questions and of course discuss it at a little later date. Yeah. So thank you and good listening.